We're in Clearwater Beach. My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Wycliffe Gordon with me this evening, and uh, enjoyed your set last night with Joe Wilder. Mm. And got, Had a great time. Yeah. You got some nice ovations from the crowd. I think they appreciate what you were doing. Well, so my first um, uh, March. Uh, what is this? March of Jazz March of Arbor's jazz. thing, yeah. yeah. It's the first time I've um, been here, and I got a chance to see some of my folks from home in Augusta, Georgia, and they've been coming for quite some time. And they were telling me about six or seven years ago, you need to do the March of Jazz. I said, I'd like to. <laughs> and I just got invited this year. And That's I'm, great. You know, I'm enjoying myself. Yeah. Nice, uh, nice to get set up with it, knowing that it's a nice event. and uh, It's really great to see the generation thing up there, you know, you playing next to Joe Wilder and hit, watching his reaction to what you play. Oh, yeah? I love that. Yeah, oh. it was uh, good. I had my eyes closed on. <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, what's it like to uh, fit in in a band that obviously is not rehearsed? Do you feel comfortable with having the repertoire under your belt? for these kinds of things? <clears throat> well, that, that always helps. It, it always helps to um, be familiar with a, a wide range of uh, the jazz repertoire. And um, you never know. You, you, you're kind of taken out of your comfort zone when you're at the uh -huh. jazz party. And they, said, and they throw a bunch of different guys together and say, OK, we're going to try this. Because you, you find comfort when you play with the same guys all the time. You know what they're going to do. They know how to interact with yeah. what it is that you're going to play in. Then it's, okay, it's a bunch of guys that you may have played with here, there, maybe a jam session. But all in all, I think that it's a, um, it's a good thing. It's a good experience. It keeps you on your toes. Mm -hmm. and, la and playing with Joe Wilder, you know, he's been, um, he's played with all the greats. And, uh, Last night he would he would uh, he would call tunes, and I, I knew most of them, but there were a couple tunes that he was calling uh, that uh, not everyone was familiar with, and it was like right, uh, and and you know <laughs> I said well there's the experience, and and, and the experience always yeah. yeah you know I know those I, I'm just amazed at the the tunes those guys have in their heads, and um, it's a huge part of of the business I guess especially at these things ah uh, yes yeah. What turned you on to music? Was it your stuff in your household that was going on? Um, pretty much. Uh, my father was a musician, mm -hmm. and he studied classical music. He was never really into jazz. Mm -hmm. He came into jazz in the, the latter part of his life with um, the few successes that I had, uh, oh. that I was having, because mm -hmm. he would be able to turn on the uh, radio. I'm from a small town in Waynesboro. And uh, in, G in Georgia, Georgia, called Waynesboro, Georgia, and um, he could get the public radio station, and they'd be playing jazz, and whenever they'd say my name on the radio, he said, that's my son. So he started to listen to jazz, but he was a great lover of classical music. Mm -hmm. He loved Chopin, he loved, you know, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, and all of that. And when we were growing up, we would hear that in the house. He had... Uh, Wired. He had reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that he kept on his piano, and he wired speakers uh, through the house and all of the bedrooms. And classical music was playing all the time. And then, you know, there was also the experience of going to church because he played in uh, several churches in Waynesboro. And Is he an organist? He, he, play, he was an organist, but he mainly played uh, piano. Mm -hmm. Mainly played piano. And um, I remember him um, <clears throat> trying to get us to take piano at an early age, and that, it was really hard to sit at the piano going one, two, three, dun, dun, and you know, doing exercises, and right outside of the window, you could hear loud and clear the boys playing football and shooting marbles. It's like, oh, I don't want to do this, and he, he didn't he, he didn't make us do it, but um, mm -hmm. we, were, we were offered yeah. the music lessons because he also taught. But I started, to, I took piano later on, I think when I was 11, I started playing trombone when I was in 12, and um, by the time I turned 13, um, I got a chance to hear jazz for the first time on record. And that was a um, five record collection set of uh, jazz, I think it was an anthology of jazz put together together by Sony. 
mm-hmm. or Columbia, whatever the record company was, and it belonged to a great aunt of mine that had just passed, and uh, of the things bequeathed to the family was that, and it wound up in our house. She lived in Boston, and we were in Georgia, and um, I used to go in the garage and put this, put the record, the record on, and then it had everything from um, slave chants up into modern jazz and what they call modern jazz at that time yeah. uh, was up to the Dizzy Gillespie big band. Right. And um, I, um, you know, and I had, there was Sunny Moon for Two by Sonny Rollins, but of everything that I listened to, I really loved the side that had the New Orleans jazz on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it had ragtime, it just had ten, ten sides, ten different um, idioms of jazz, if you would. And I listened to the Keyhole Blues by Louis Armstrong, and I was it's my second going into my third year playing trombone, maybe. Mm-hmm. And so I began to try to imitate the instruments that Louis Armstrong sang, and I would always just listen to that. Now, yeah. At that time, um, we were into the popular music of the day. Uh, I think the popular rock group was Kiss. The popular R&B groups was like Rick James or Parliament Funkadelic Cool in the game. So we were into listening to that right. and trying to play those things. But when I was by myself, I'd always go into the garage and I'd play that <laughs> record. And so and and that was pretty much my introduction to jazz. Mm-hmm. My, I think my father introduced us to music. Yeah. But that was my introduction to yeah. jazz music. I have to chuckle because, you know, most of the fellows I've talked to are considerably older and for you to say the popular music of the day is kiss <laughs> that's, that's a bit different you know oh. that's that that's fu- that's very interesting though did mm. did your um your, your friends at the time probably did not share your growing enthusiasm f- for jazz music well um they did we had what was called the a jazz band or stage band uh-huh but the thing was, we weren't playing the music of Duke Ellington, Count Basie, or Benny Goodman, Fletcher Henderson. We were playing um, stage band instrumental, mu- um, the instrumental music of popular tunes, oh. like Beat It or Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. And mm-hmm. every now and then, the, a piece of Duke Ellington's music was wi- would wound, wind up in mm-hmm. their book, but we didn't really... Yeah, we weren't really into it. So I mean, we called it the jazz because it was instrumental music without words. But um, and we played some of the classics, like we played in the mood. Mm-hmm. We played Moonlight Serenade. We played um, a couple of others. Uh, I don't know, Duke Ellington, Satin Doll, things like that. But um, for the other students or friends of mine, it pretty much stopped right there. Yeah, we try to improvise, but my. My love for jazz, um, I think, just continued to grow, I guess, particularly after this um, <clears throat> concert that I did when I was in the eighth grade. It was the last year that they were having junior high school, and uh, which was, was it, seventh and eighth grade, and then the school system there in Georgia switched to middle schools and mm-hmm. so we, instead of this just a, t- a tenth grade class going to high school we had two classes the ninth grade and the tenth grade uh, class that would be going to high school so a lot of the high school students came to hear the concert and you know there in Georgia was not a lot of uh, musicians that knew too much about improvisation let alone how to develop that uh, skill and um, in my experience anyway but me and this one other guy, a trumpet player named Brian, said, we're not going to play the written solo. We're going to, listen, let's make our solo up. We're going to improvise. Mm-hmm. And the feeling that I got for, from that, I was 13 then. Uh, the response that I got from the uh, crowd, it was a lot of the high school students coming to see the students from their feeder school that were going to come. They said, yeah. what kind of, we're getting, two classes, we're getting two classes of musicians. Let's see what's going to be coming to the high school. And mm-hmm. They enjoyed it. They clapped. And I said, oh. This is a great feeling. I said, I think I want to be a jazz musician <laughs> one day. And, you know, I went through the thing where I wanted to be a boxer. I wanted to be a truck driver. I wanted to play football. Um, but um, of all of those desires, nothing really no, nothing really stuck like music. And then, then doing an interview about five or six years ago, someone asked uh, the question, was this something that you always knew that you wanted to do? And I said, well, and I thought about it. I said, you know what, when I was 13, and I remember that concert, and I said, um, I, I asked for this. I said, um, I wanted to be a jazz musician, and lo and behold, I'm 
doing it professionally now. So yeah. I always say, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's but worked out pretty good so far. It know? has. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. I've seen you on uh, numerous programs, and uh, you've been pretty well recorded so far. I, uh, your your meeting with uh, Winton was pretty fortuitous. Wasn't it, it was. I, it was. I remember the day that I um, met him. It was in February 1987, and all of the someone said Winton Marsalis is going to come by the school, and all the guys that were really into um, jazz, and it, what what wasn't very many, but everyone knew who Winton Marsalis was because I believe at that time he'd won Grammys in classical and jazz music, mm -hmm. and they were like. Man, Wentz coming to the school. Wentz come. I was like, okay, you know, whatever. I mean, not that not that I heard about him, but I was into listening to Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. I said, well, this is a young cat. He can't, you know, yeah. possibly be playing like this. So I was like, Wentz, Schmitten, and um, got a chance to meet him. <laughs> He's a nice guy, very yeah. down to earth. Um, just a, you know, a cool person, great person to hang with. And then after I began to uh, work with him a couple years later. Um, it was just he, he remained the same, you know, just a great person. He's a great teacher. He was never really uh, a lot of people used to ask us. He's like a like a like a workhorse. Does he make you practice? I no, he never. He see, he never says anything about practicing. You know, you get on the bandstand and you hear him play, and he, do, and he uh, when he does his thing, it's like okay. Da -dee -dee -dee. <laughs> you know, back to the basics. Just, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in that my experience in that band was, it was one of, it was a great growth growth period for me because everyone wanted to be better. They were always striving to be better. We were always talking about what they could do to make the solos, mm -hmm. their, their presentation um, better. And we talked about it all the time, and um, I haven't really had that. I re haven't really had that experience since, but it's, it was a, it was a great uh, growing it was a great growing growing mm -hmm. situation uh, for me. Yeah. So, is there a difference in your opinion of how young jazz players make their mark in today's music than you know twenty five years ago or? Uh, um, how they make them mark? Well, l let me put it this way: Some people have said that uh, the, the young musicians get their own bands a lot mm -hmm. sooner mm -hmm. than some of the the fellows like Sweets Edison and, and mm -hmm. Al Gray and all those guys. Does that seem to be true in your case? Um, and my put in in our generation, I think that that does happen. In my case, I think that I. I waited a, a a little while. I played with Winton for Winton for almost what well, was been about uh, about ten since eighty nine, mm -hmm. eleven, twelve, going on twelve years uh, now, and I've had an association with him. I still do, yeah. but in terms of acting as a leader, there was a time someone had come to me, heard me on a couple gigs with uh, Winton, and said, "You know, you should record a record." And at that time, I felt that I was still in a at, in a period or in a stage of my growth where I, I, I just wasn't ready to um, to do that. It was like a choice between leave the band, start a solo career, or stay in the band and uh, continue to develop at the pace. And, and you know, once I kind of fit, because my whole, the, the first year and a half, almost two years I was in the band, I didn't get a chance to play a lot because I was the seventh member to join the septet and there was not a, uh, a there was not a lot of music written, and then I had to get my stuff together because when when, when I met Winston when I was in college, it was, was kind of like big fish in a small pond. And then when I got a chance to hear them play, it's like, oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, you know, they, this is what's happening. You know, cats that are playing. I wasn't exposed to what was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, on the jazz scene. You know, I heard about it, but I got a chance to hear it firsthand with one of the most influential young musicians and. Um, so when when I was offered that opportunity, I said, "Oh, this is great!" But I said, "I can br break away now and you know attempt it." But they, I just I just felt that what was happening for me then was was it was it was a much greater thing for me. But as a whole, I believe that in our generation, a lot of the guys are starting bands mm -hmm. earlier. Whereas in the um, the 
generations that included uh, Sweet Salad Edison, uh, uh, folks like Al Gray, uh, and, and and those musicians of that caliber. It was I think it was great to be a part of a a great band or a great situation when you were in a band with all you know all those those great musicians and they had they had great leaders and um, it's hard to in in, in any um, era really to keep a band together for for, for several reasons. Um, reason can be money. Uh, reason can be mainly you have guys that become great players, mm -hmm. great individual players, and they want to be band leaders. And all the great players are not necessarily not necessarily great band leaders, but the thing is, if everyone was to become a great player, then you'd have you never you never really would have a a um, band a band like when the the John Coltrane Quartet. You know, they, they stayed together. And even when and Miles, he went through uh, uh, several um, bands. But guys, you think about someone like Harry Carney that uh, stayed with Duke 40. His whole professional music career yeah. was with uh, Duke Ellington's band. And um, and I guess he felt, um, as, I, as I did for uh, a, a great period of the time that I was with Wenton mm -hmm. Marsalis, this is a great musical situation. Yeah. This is where the I growth belong. It just, <laughs> just, just, just takes place here. I can go out and become a solo uh, musician and try to become a star. But you know, musically, you have to. You just have to ask yourself sometimes, what, what, are you, what, what are you going to be? What's going to give you the greatest gratification? Mm -hmm. The money that you're going to make as a leader, the prestige of being a leader, or what you're going to gain musically when you take, which, which is, I guess, the. Um, the the emphasis behind these uh, jazz parties get a bunch of great guys together and play even if it's just for thirty minutes. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's um it's a uh, uh, so I think the answer to you, to to your question is yes. And our generation guys are a lot quicker to become you know leaders. And you know I I, I used to hear that even from uh, my high school band director. Oh, it's great that you're playing with Marcellus, but I'm ready for you to go and do your own thing. And 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 it's it's kind of um. It's uh, hard because when you have a great band together, it's like, good. So you have a great band with great players. Not saying that I was a great player, but or the, 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 I mean, and he, I'll certainly say to the other guys, well, but what if everyone said, oh, well, I want to have my band, I want to have my band, I want to have my band. And then, you know, if, if you have a continuous cycle of, well, you have your band, you have a band together for five years, and then the guys in your band become great players. So then no one would ever really have, you know, have a band. And I think... Uh, the strength of a lot of the organizations, even when it was with the big bands, was that they had great players that just stayed in the band. Mm -hmm. You know, they did a couple of solo projects on the side, right. but um, what made those bands great, they had great players in the band. Yeah. You know, you think, th think of those great big bands. They weren't great because the leaders were great. Yeah. <laughs> they were great because it's, it's, it, it, was the, it was the team effort. Yeah. So, um, I, I do think that that happens a little more in our generation. We're really quick to, because you know, the, the pressures of that kind of thing, mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial spirit. Now let's go, and I, I think I think that it's a good, but I think it's also good to understand the importance of, of of having a great unit mm -hmm. and guys staying together for that purpose right. for music. So, who are your major trombone influences? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know this doesn't answer your question. I think my greatest influence was not a trombone player. It was uh, mm. Louis Armstrong, yeah. actually. Um, but guys that played with him, um, I'm often asked the question, who's my favorite? Um, I, I, I don't really have one favorite because the, the trombone has many voices. And um, you have people like Jack Teagarden or Trummy Young, guys like... Um, Al Gray, even Frank Rosalino, a guy like like Bill Walters. I admired Bill Walters for a long time. Well, I got a chance to hear him when I was in high school and um, started to develop my plan. I heard a recording of him. I was like, man, okay, yeah. trombone, <laughs> right? And, and then you know, I got a chance to meet him and, and play with him live. Um, who else? I mean, I like guys like Vic Dickinson and Dickie Wells because of how they use the trombone for what you have I mean you have guys that um, played plunger and there's, there's so many different ways the difference between the way Al Gray plays or the way that uh, 
Tricky Sam Nanton, please. All the way to Bubba Miley, please. Plunge it. The difference between him and mm -hmm. Cootie Williams. Um, and even though they're, they're, they're trumpet players, but just, you know, speaking a little bit about the plunger. Um, oh. Who else? There, 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 there's so many guys. Yeah, you know, I love Slide Hampton. He, uh, um, I wouldn't say that he was a, a, a traditional, a traditional, as is categorized with the early New Orleans style or even the Dixieland style. Um, I love J.J. Johnson. He's great. He's one of the cleanest trombone players ever. Mm -hmm. You know, I love Curtis Full. I got a chance to work with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, there, 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 there are many major influences. I say guys like um, Lawrence Brown. Mm -hmm. um, he played the trombone like a trombone. He didn't try to do the acrobatics of a saxophone or a trumpet. Oh. He played the trombone. He sang. He sang when he played. Um, a lot of guys, Britt Woodman even, guys, you know, uh, some of the, well, he, he's no longer with us, but Buster Cooper, he, the way he played trombone, he, he, you know, he'll, when he wants to, he can play pretty and he's sweet, but when he wants to let it just fly, he's like, whip! Didn't they, say, <laughs> and they call him the bumblebee or something? I guess. Yeah. I guess. I guess. But I mean, you know, and one of one of the great thing about I didn't get a chance to meet all of these guys, but um, their their personalities are just so uh, great. They're they're they're, they're, great, they're great people. Mm -hmm. Like and like I said, uh, Louis Armstrong is my I would say is my the one. Uh, if I had to choose one person one that, that was most influential mm -hmm. in jazz slash music to me, I would have to say it was Louis Armstrong. But Guys that played with him, Quentin Butter Jackson. Yeah, I know he, he was another great trombone player, yeah. um, and he was also one another one of the great plunger mute men. Um, the guy that played vibes, I ne I can I can never think of his name, and he's uh, um, he played with Pops, he played with Duke, um, and he was a great vibraphonist. Not Hampton, not Hampton. Mm -hmm. No, the one uh, not not slide. Uh, it's not Al Gray. I can't think of it. It's going to come to me in a second. Um, oh, Tyree Glenn. Oh. I can never I can never think of why. I always get tied up with his name, Tyree. He, Tyree, uh, he played, played, with, yeah, played with Louis Armstrong. He was a great, he was a great trombonist mm -hmm. also. And um, I called all of those names. Uh, I think they all influenced me because I, at one point in time, always I spent time studying this uh the style of playing mm -hmm. or a particular solo that they may have done like the difference right. between Al, the way Al Gray plays plunger the way Tyree plays the way that uh, Quentin Butter Jackson plays mm -hmm. the way that uh, Tricky Sam Nanton plays they have a different approach to the plunger and I, I listen to all of those Open Horn the guys that played with Louis Armstrong the way that Jack Teagarden I, I love Jack Teagarden he's great I mean he had great um, command and mastery of the instrument yeah. but he played a little different from Trummy Young and um, but I like you know I like both I like both of their both of their styles Vic mm -hmm. Dickinson and Dickie Wells you listen to them play sometimes you just want to start laughing because they they they, they um they played kind of had a a human element in the uh, or a, a, a vocal element when yeah. they played on some of the recordings that I've heard and they're just uh, I heard one recording of uh, I can't think of the name of the recording, but it was with a a, uh, a comedy show, and um, they were playing, and Vic Dickinson, Dick, it was one of them, and they started off their phrase like, don't dare, don't, huh? it was just like, you know, like someone saying something, uh -huh. and I said, it, it was just, it was just, I said, oh man, and I, I'd have never thought to just do that on the horn, and, and, and um, you know, the, again, just the many different approaches so mm -hmm. I listen to I listen to the way people talk from time to time I think about the way that people laugh from time to time mm -hmm. so when I go to play I just I don't try to play the the note that fit in this chord or the scale that I don't try not to make it technical but more um, a vocal which is what I figured that the instrument is you know truly yeah. for it very should, good for it should sing yeah. yeah that's a good uh, talking point about what people think about when they're improvising. Mm -hmm. Are you a, a chordal oriented person? I mean, 
Do you did you have theory on the way up, so mm. that you know what all those chord changes mean? <coughs> yes, yeah. I, I I had music theory. Um, I did it in the classroom uh, from a quote unquote technical point of view, and then you know yeah. made it practical. I thought about the well, this chord goes. These are uh, these are the notes that go with this chord: the C seven, C E G B flat. And if I wanted to put the nine on it, I could do this, and then went through these stage of practicing <coughs> patterns that um, would go with certain chords. But then, you know, from listening to Louis Armstrong, the, the only difference between his trumpet playing and his singing was uh, the octave in which he went and then he played the trumpet and octave higher than what he sang. The, and, and there was, the, the, other than that, there was no difference. No difference. And I said, so I began to sing. So when I'm, when I'm playing, I'm thinking about what, what what I'm hearing, you know, and I, I began as uh, in my study of theory um, to begin to do things rather than sit down to the piano and uh, come up with a formula that you can write down on the paper. But I began to try to work on things that would um, help to develop my ear. So I would do ear training exercises, like in order to truly hear the sound of a chord or a form, something like the blues. Um, I would sing all the chords rather than just play them. Mm -hmm. I would sing them and say, okay, because when you sing, then you and, and when you, it is important to sing in tune. When when you sing them, then you're forced you, you're forced to hear. Um, you have to you have to hear the correct pitches. When you're playing an instrument, you go up to the piano, you hit the key, it's, the note is going to come out. You playing a a brass instrument, you have your embouchure set in the right mode of resonance, enough air, right finger in right position, the note is going to come out. But when you sing, then you have to you have to you have to adjust the pitch and you have to hear the pitch. Mm -hmm. So I began to do things like that and then I would take a form like the blues and just start, you know, improvising. Boom, boom, do, dee, 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 do, dee, 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 boom, dee, 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 boom, boom, dee, 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 do, 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 dee, 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 do, and I, and I began to just sing it. So when I'm, I would pick my horn up, I began to hear phrases that I would sing, rather than uh, it being a a task. Oh, I'm playing the trombone. I have to play the. I have to play these notes and in this position. I began to play the things that I was hearing, that I was singing, and I, I think that my improvisation began to improve, at least for me as an individual, because I began to play what I was hearing rather than what I'd figured out by practicing the patterns in uh, person A's method book or person B's mm -hmm. uh, book of transcriptions or things like that. And it's and, and the, all, all of those things are good steps when you I, I believe when you're working on improvisation. Some of the jazz cats, quote unquote, don't like to use the Jamie Abersol method. I say, don't knock that. I say, hey, it's always good to have live musicians, but if that's all you have, then hey, deal with that. That that that, that was good for me when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I can play with the uh, you know Jamie Abersol record. Now you don't get a chance to do any interaction because no right. matter where you start. You know, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good from that standpoint. But um, once I began to sing, you know, takes Louis Armstrong's approach from scatting. I, I began. I, I think my improvisation began to improve. Mm -hmm. So when I'm playing, if I don't, if I don't hear something, I try not to fall back on because I did go through this stage too. I would fall back on um, cliched phrases. <laughs> things that people would recognize like bubble dee 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 do 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 dee people are like oh yeah that's cute like okay and then as I got older I was like okay it's not so <laughs> cute anymore yeah <laughs> let me address him cause you know you play that for the older musicians it's like oh okay. you know the guys that really want to deal with uh, or to um play in the spirit of true improvisation and um that would happen from uh, time to time when we were on the road and now uh, Win Winston's uh, band with the septet. When you know, because when you when uh, that point we were talking about earlier about um, guys leaving the band early, but when you play with musicians for a long time, um, you get to know what they like to do. You get to know their strengths, and uh, you get to know um, 
you know, you, you can play something and they know what you like. Mm -hmm. You know, they go, well, let's try this, let's try that. And then every now and then you'll step off on a limb and you say, I'm just gonna, just gonna go for it. You just, you, 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 you're hearing something and you want to just play something just totally new, totally fresh. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't always work out, but just in the spirit of doing it, um, it, it can be very exhilarating. And there are those times when it does work out. Yeah. That's one thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm answering my, making my answers too long. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, I, um, in, in talking to the, the veteran musicians along the way, the older, of course, you're a veteran now for sure. Oh. The, 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 of the, Thanks. Of the, I get you know, three or four generations ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're, I, uh, I don't want to get my benefits. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> don't quit your gig yet. <laughs> okay, I won't. I won. There seem to have been a considerable fraternity mm -hmm. amongst the musicians in, in the jazz world. And I wonder if if you feel at this point, mm -hmm. is, is there a, a real kind of bond, a, a helping of each other in the, in the community of, of people you work with? I think that, I think that it's, um, I think that it's happening. It's, it's kind of hard to tell because I'm not, um, one that most of the time when I travel, I'm in the hotel, I'm in my room working on music, so I don't get a chance to interact with a lot of um, musicians, but it's been, I think it's kind of like a catch-22. There are those of us that try to um, stick together, support one another in the name or in, in, in the spirit of what the older musicians would do, because I feel like there was a... Um, a generation of musicians where that existed and that could have been the Swiss Edison's generation with guys like excuse me um, Britt Woodman um, and then came the uh, bebop period and, and not that all the guys took took on this view but it became I think that it became more of a me thing and about it became more of, of uh, music for the musicians, and and that not that the non-musicians couldn't listen to it, but I think uh, there was a social element in the music during during the swing era where people would get together and go listen to the music because they didn't just have to sit down and listen at a concert; they could dance with the music, and mm -hmm. it was a it, it it had a social element that invited everyone, and um, I think when, when when the not just when the bebop period came along because I tell uh, this this story I had some uh, friends of mine uh, trombone there's a a jam session that takes place in New York the first Monday of um, every month at this sculptor's house Clem Meadmore I don't know if you uh, know about that but musicians just come over there and most of the time it's by invitation I was invited by a friend of mine David Oswald and um, they play tradi mostly tr traditional jazz or trad jazz as they call it uh -huh. and again my entered most of the guys in my generation were introduced to jazz through the bebop yeah era whereas I, I started out listening to Louis Armstrong I heard a little Sonny Rollins uh, I may hear a little John Coltrane but I used to listen to Louis Armstrong uh, Penny or Pennies from Heaven that, that, that's the kind of thing that I that that, that I liked and I, I couldn't tell you why back then but it was something about that um I knew that whenever I would listen to Louis Armstrong play, I felt good. Whenever I just watch, whenever I saw any video footage of him playing, the people felt good, and there's something about that I liked. Bebop music was um, it was very sophisticated rhythmically and harmonically, but it seemed that the music had become more about the music and music for the musicians, and not that a, a the complete dance element was taken out of the music but it was a, a lot of it was yeah. you know it's the difference between dancing to uh for dancers only and trying to dance to giant steps now while giant steps is uh, uh when it comes to dealing with that uh technically harmonically I and mean, you, you you're challenged but with your technical proficiency in terms of playing with velocity because at the speed which the tune goes you're challenged um by your 
um, harmonically because at the rate which the chord changes. Right. And this is, you know, but you know, who wants to put that on? You want to put it on and you listen to it and you can enjoy it, but not too many people are going to want to dance to that. Thelonious Mark K. even though he was in the bebop era, he kind of kept a dance element to his music because his his music, it pretty much dances. Um, but I'm getting away from the... Uh, <laughs> Right, I like this subject. I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting away from the question, but um, and I think all of that it, it, it has something to do with the way the musicians are towards uh, one another. I think when the bebop era came in, the music just like you know, it's, a, it's about me kind of thing. As 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 where they when you're playing music that was more communal, like a big band, or when you were playing. The New Orleans style of traditional, or, or the, what they call Dixieland, it was, a, it was all it was all interactive. It was it was a, it was a communal thing. It wasn't about I'm soloing and you know check out what I'm doing. It's, um, it, it, it was more communal. And I think the guys that that uh, and ladies, the the people that played that music, they were um, more communal in their pro approach to life and to each other. Um, and our generation today, because. Most of the mu musicians grew up listening to um, bebop. One thing that I think I dislike is it's it's hard sometimes. It seems like a lot of the musicians don't really get or give props to another musician until you know until after they're dead and gone. Um, so some of us, I I'd say, a great majority of the musicians when once when we see the guys we haven't seen in a while, they're very 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 supportive. Uh, um, but then there's that generation of musicians that really, uh, for one reason or another, they're not happy with the way their career went. Mm -hmm. They are not satisfied with uh, the young lions, so to speak. Then they're, they're not satisfied. Then uh, what well, well, the way their career went, and then you have young lions uh, coming up and they're getting recognition, and they were not happy with the. You know, for, for 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 various reasons. So rather than to deal with the majesty and the music, um, it, it, they began to take it um, personally. And then, and and then there's, for lack of a better term, I'll say confusion. Um, in terms of well, who's supporting who? Uh -huh. And we're all musicians. You know, jazz is not. We're not making millions and millions of dollars playing jazz. Maybe maybe a few people are, but it's not like when you go to a rock concert yeah. or to a rap concert. So why in the jazz community should we not support uh, one another? And I think that's one of the great things about these jazz parties. Yeah. And I haven't been. Um, I'm kind of a baby to the jazz parties because working with Wenton Marsalis, we were on the road almost 300 days out of the year. I wasn't available to go mm -hmm. to 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 a lot of them, but. Um, it's great when you when you have someone like Joe Wilder. Um, I'll say this and I'll be quiet. Or Britt Woodman. They were always um, supportive of the younger cats, and that doesn't happen. The generation between Joe Wilder, I'll say between a musician between Joe Wilder and mine, they're always uh, always supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and e e even in their teaching, um, they weren't um, patronizing. They were always supportive. Always had something good to say. Always gave a word of encouragement. Sweet Sedison, he was he, he you know he was the same way. Now he didn't like something. He didn't like it, mm -hmm. but he, he he would never be like, well, you know, you need to do this. You know, or, the, or these young guys, they're not playing anything. Now, they, he never really had the attitude. And there's a lot of musicians that are mm -hmm. you know that that, that are kind of like that. And and some of them are guys in our gener in, in our generation. I said, well, you know, what happened to the spirit of, you know, trying to. Uh, to Trying to play, Buster Buster Cooper. He's an, he's another. He's always just always. He said, "Man, you 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 young guys are doing it. And you're carrying on the tradition, and, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's always. We, and I, I think we need those. Yeah. We, we 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 need we need those guys to um uh, you know to to egg us on and to be supportive. We, I think you're right, and I think the some of that comes. Some of the lack of that, I th believe, comes uh, from this term I heard recently, and that was jazz in the Middle Ages, that the, p the people that are in that generation of, of being around 50 or so forth, some of them feel that th the younger guys are getting all the marketing support mm -hmm. and the record company support and, mm -hmm. you know, what about me? Right. And th th there's a lot of that. Yeah. Joe Wilder doesn't take on that. Uh, he doesn't take on that attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, Buster Cooper, he didn't take on that attitude. 
uh, Brent Woodman. You know, he didn't take on that attitude. But some of the guys that are that are under him, it seems like they're bitter. It's like, hey, man, you could not be playing jazz at all. Yeah. I mean, things, things, things haven't always been great. I mean, you know, just like in life, that there's ups and there's downs. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you take the good with the bad, and you just try to roll with yeah. it. And I think that's the spirit that those guys had. Right. Because the time that they come up playing, I mean, they were, in, in terms of social conditions and whatnot, they, they, they were not as great as they, you know, the greatest they are now. Mm -hmm. So, and I say, if you, if you have guys that grew up in that time period, and they live and, and, uh, they live with a certain amount of optimism. I mean, you know, how could you go wrong? Yeah. So, you know, jazz was uh, very important in helping to break down some social barriers, uh, racial barriers. Even preceded uh, um, Jackie Robinson. And mm -hmm. where's the state of that in music now for you? Um, from what you see, anyway. I think that. Um, that it, I guess there's um, elements of everything that it existed before that are still prevalent. I don't, but I, I haven't really, me personally, I haven't really experienced, um, um, but uh, much of anything that's uh, negative. I haven't been always, I haven't always been happy with anything from my playing to, well, maybe, uh, well, I didn't get this gig, or it didn't work out, or a promoter didn't pay me, you know, things, mm -hmm. things happen, but I think it all depends on just how you look at, the, how, how you look at life. Do you want to live in, com do you want to be a person that's going to live and complain about your condition, or wh whatever the conditions are, do you want to uh, do something about them? I mean, it's one thing to recognize um, uh, something, you can either do something about it, or um, I think, get around it. I don't know. See, am I answering your question? Does I, I think there's that there, there may I don't I, I don't I don't think it is. You know, we're not going in the musicians' interests. I or I mean, you know, there's stage interests, but I've never walked up to a water fountain and said white only or colored only. I haven't I haven't I haven't seen it. But you know, different places you go and. It can be a small town or whatever. There, there, there's still people that live in the world that are prejudiced. I feel sorry mm -hmm. for them, yeah. um, but I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I haven't experienced. I haven't experienced much of Good. that. I'm glad. Actually, so. what's in the near future for you? You got your own group on and off. Is it a thing that you have trouble keeping together, or just as the opportunities present themselves? As, uh, I just I, I would go with the ladder. I think just as opportunities present themselves. I haven't decided yet that I wanted to work full time on the road with a mm -hmm. band, the Wycliffe Gordon Quartet, Quintet, Sextet, Septet, Big Band, I don't know. Yeah. Um, right now I'm composing a lot. Mm. Um, I, I recently did a film score for a silent film that was done at 25 by Oscar Michaud um, called Body and Soul. I want to do that. What I, what, what's on the burner for me, I like to do everything in music, whether I ever get an award for it or not, doesn't matter, but I love choir music, I love gospel music, I love, uh, of course, I love jazz music, I love, I love classical music. I like to publish a book of some of uh, my, well, several books of some of my works, mm -hmm. even if it's for small ensembles, uh, you know, trombone, choir, brass quintet, or I like to and actually record the music. So if I don't hear it, it doesn't have to be played on national public radio. It can just be played in my living room. Yeah. But I, I'd like to be able to hear everything that I've written, get it out of here on the paper, and maybe, you know, get the music performed. Um, I think I've always been to teaching. I'm presently teaching in, at Michigan State and will be involved with the new... Um, jazz program at Juilliard to start in fall of uh, 2001. Great. Um, I love to play and to perform, but I love to write because a performance can last in the... If, if you get it recorded, it can last forever, but um, I, I would like to um, continue to compose mm -hmm. um, music for various 
aggregations, but not you know not just jazz. Yeah. And that's that that's what I would like to uh that's that's what I would like to do. Where's your inspiration come from for writing new music? Oh, different things. Could be life experiences. Um, I, I um, grew up in the church down south. I was in church every Sunday, wh whether I wanted to be or not. I'd really like to do a. Uh, I really would like to do a, a gospel album. I recorded a record on Crisscross called "The Gospel Truth," which was hymns and uh, spirituals and a couple of original uh, compositions. Um, but it depends. It, it it comes from many things, but mainly things that are blues based and uh um the feeling i guess of the music of the church mm -hmm. and um you know and, and i think it's intertwined with many different many different things and um sometimes i just i'm walking around i just i hear things and i start to uh <laughs> sing and i learned a very important lesson when I was in um, college, I write everything down now <laughs> because if you don't, it is. It, I think it's very mysterious um, how, how how this uh, music thing works in, in terms of new music coming to you. It was, and I'll, I'll never forget it. I I was playing in the symphonic band. And I said I want to write a piece of symphonic or or uh, um, wind ensemble music, and it was just clear to me as day. And it took place over a three-day period. And I said, oh, this is the theme. Because I was in college taking a music course, and we were studying, I forget, Stravinsky or someone, and um, talking about theme and variation, the theme and how to develop the theme. And um, I said, I want to write a piece of this music. And it was the spring season when we have concert band. And, um, and I heard the French horn part. I heard the trumpet parts. I heard all the percussion parts. And I said, the first day and the second day. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then this guy, and I didn't write it down because it was just clear and just fresh in my mind. And the third day, I was on the bus going somewhere. And I said, oh, yeah, and this is how I can end the piece. And I said, this would be, I, you know, I felt like it would be a great piece of music. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, on the fourth, like on that fourth day, um, it was gone. It's just, and it was, it, it was strange. And I, I could remember fragments of it where just the day before, I could hear the whole piece from beginning to end, my first symphonic piece of music. Mm. And I said, oh man, it was just wild. And then like two, maybe like two years later, I was riding in the car listening to a classical radio station. And, I, and, and, and a piece of music I never heard before, I, was, I found myself singing along with it and I was like, I said, I was just, I was baffled. So I never, in one other instance, where, where it happened, where it wasn't my music, but a piece of Wynton Marsalis's music. We, we were playing from In This House on This Morning, and we recorded the music, and it had not come out yet. And we were on a tour somewhere on the west coast, some small rural town, I'm in the Midwest, and one of the themes that he wrote. And on the radio that was listening to a jazz station, we had about 20 minutes to get to the um, sound check, and a um, guitarist comes on playing. I said, okay, well, the first um, four measures, and I was like, ah. Oh, it was just hearing the same thing, and then he played the next, uh, and and uh, again we hadn't recorded the music, and it, but this and this was recorded because it was on the radio, and it was almost it was almost exactly identical to what what went and had written, and we all just looked at each other in the van. I said, man, it's it's wild how this music thing this music thing happens because it was no um, correlation. Between, between the t uh, b between the two, wow. between Wynton and whoever this person was, mm -hmm. I was like, and so, and we saw him. So I said, man, you're not gonna believe this. Uh, this was one segment from a piece that you had written, and it was almost exactly note for note, chord change for chord change, the same thing. So I I learned from th my experience. 
to that when I hear some music, if I don't have music paper, I'll write five. I'll make a staff and I'll just I'll, I'll write it down mm -hmm. or enough of it that where I I know if when I come back to it, yeah. what 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 I was what frame of mind I was in, mm -hmm. and also from that experience listening to that piece of music that was reminiscent of something that Wenton had done, I said, man, it's it's strange how things just work in the mm -hmm. um, world of music or just how music moves around. And one last uh, quick thing, I was at a jam session with Wes Anderson in New Orleans and um, Wenton's band hadn't been together. He stopped the set in December 1995. So this was like 96, 97. And um, they were playing a blues on the stage. Victor Gorns was improvising and Wes picked up his horn and I picked up my horn at the same time and we were just going to play a background. and. And we were just, we were coming in at the same time. And we just looked at each other. It's like we both heard, we were like we were both hearing the same thing. Wow. And Wenton used to talk about that with um, one of the guys that was in the band one time, with Todd Williams. How sometimes we will not just wind up on the same note, but end up playing the same phrase. Mm -hmm. And then we just like, we would just look at each other and say, <laughs> say who did that? <laughs> so. I guess there's some ideas. Musical ideas floating around out there, and yes. pe people tune into them at the same time. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Just to wrap up here, um, did you get a chance to watch most of the uh, Ken Burns thing? I've seen very, I've seen very little of it. But uh -huh. what I have seen, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. I think, I think it's. Um, well, I don't know if you're asking me what I think about it, but I was getting ready to tell you. What do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> um. I think it's great, uh, s simply for this uh, for this reason. It's something positive about our music mm -hmm. that is being done. It's televised and given to the masses. Yeah. Um, amongst the musicians, there's been controversy. There's too much went Marsalis on it. Well, they didn't cover anything after 1965. Well, they didn't have any. Um, they didn't talk about all the piano players. I said, well, you know, if they didn't talk about piano players. Imagine what they did to the trombone. Uh, <laughs> they didn't say anything about. It. And you know, I didn't. I didn't watch. I don't get a chance to watch much television. Vision. So, I bought the um, the video box set, when mm -hmm. I, and I, I would get a chance to watch it at my leisure. But I was out. We were doing a a, a residency activity in uh, Decorah, Iowa, somewhere. It was a part of a. Um, <clears throat> A grant that they had to bring Lincoln Center and out to do jazz workshops in uh, residences in, in rural areas. And the Ken Burns series, it was a couple of months ago, it was in February, Ken, Ken Burns series was on television. And the people that came to our workshop had so much more because we were there two years um, prior uh -huh. and we were supposed to complete, go to, to four small towns um, twice within a three year period. That was a, a part of the grant program and the people that watched the Ken Burns it was on before they came to our performance that night they had so much more of a, an appreciation for jazz music because they didn't have a jazz record store please um, <laughs> probably no jazz radio station yeah. um, nothing but they saw they, they, they saw that on television and they said well we saw the Ken Burns series and they were really excited about jazz not because they had to go and it's one thing to listen to it on record but with that with that uh, video series they have uh, the music footage and then you see the musicians talking about the music and you get a chance to watch them play live so it's, it's a whole nother uh, means uh, um, uh, a whole nother level of appreci appreciation that you can develop for it and for that reason when we were and I think it was Pella we were in Pella, Iowa for that reason I say that this is a it's a great series mm. I don't care if they didn't they didn't get all the piano players they didn't get all the trombone players they didn't cover everything and, and my thing to all the guys that guys the all the guys that say that whatever they didn't cover get into the you can get into the entrepreneurial spirit and you can do a video series and call it the Monk Row series or I'll call it the Wycliffe Gordon series and I'll cover the trombone right. players but what yeah. what he did what what that did for jazz um, what that did for jazz was great yeah because it, it 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 did what we don't get a chance to do often yeah. people come to these jazz parties all the pe other people they're hip to jazz yeah. 
they, 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 you know, they, they, they know what the deal is. They're gonna go and hear a bunch of musicians get together that hadn't played together before, that play together very little, and they get a chance to hear some of the, you know, hear some of the music that that they grew up listening to, and some of the younger people that were uh, fortunate enough to have parents that played jazz music in the home, and said, well, I can go and hear some live jazz, and it's gonna be spontaneous, and it's gonna be just like a party. Yeah. So um, my thing is. Um, I think that the Ken Burns series is uh, great. And, uh, you know, because I feel like this, if he would have put everyone in the video, include myself, then there would be someone talking about, well, he didn't need to be in it. She didn't need to be in there. Oh, they did too much on this. They did too much on that. Ken, Ken Burns, I think it was, it, was yeah. great, it was a great series. And it was, it was great. It was great. It is great for jazz. Yeah. So. Well, you're, you know, you're the second person just today who described the same scenario. Mm -hmm. getting in front of a group of people and all of a sudden they're more hip mm -hmm. than they were before the thing was shown exactly and and so that's that's good and that and and and, and for that reason i say a plus yeah. plus <laughs> right yes well listen i i appreciate you spending this time with me and oh, i enjoyed it i really hope the best for your your career and, oh. and your composing especially i love to hear that writing new music that people are doing that out there and okay because it really lasts you know i'll make sure that i get your card or whatever now all i'll right. send you some okay great thanks for your time all right appreciate it yeah.